probably. And this is one you. That was one you probably haven't heard. This is one you definitely. That was a really. This is one. This is one. Yeah. That's why you hadn't heard. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. That's all. Uh, you definitely have heard this one. something. Hope this doesn't make you feel weird or uncomfortable. If it does, just go with me. Um, you have two hands. You just take one hand and place it at your ear. Place the other hand at your heart. And just let's pray right now and ask God to anoint our ears and anoint our hearts so that we hear him. Would you do that with me? And just give you a moment to pray that. Ask God to just anoint your ears, your anoint your hearing, and anoint your, anoint your heart, your soul. Father, we invite you to enter in. We invite you to teach us. We invite you to speak. And then, Father, I just, I'm going to put my hand now over my mouth, and I just don't want anything to come out of my mouth. I'm going to hold, put one over my brain, too. I don't want anything to come out of this brain or this mouth that does not come from you. And I pray that you would be the one we meet with here, just as certainly as Job met you there in that storm. And I just ask you to take over. 
to your glory. Surprise us. In your name I pray. Amen. Donuts. Don't forget the donuts. Grab one at any time. I, I just want to say, wow, it's hard to believe. Night six. Uh, whoa. And to cover Job's seven chapters, another wow. And not a single time has any evening been where I thought it would be. Tonight, I really thought I would be focused on God showing up more than anything during my time, but I'm getting ahead of myself. But no, it's interesting. I'm spending more time on what Elihu had to say. Uh, but welcome to the main event, the grand finale, uh, the end of a very arduous journey. It has been a long bout that Job has been in. And up to now, Job has been wrestling with someone who has not even physically stepped in the ring. And when God shows up, he doesn't get into Job's ring. God brings his own ring. Pardon the pun, but Almighty Sovereign is Lord of the ring. Okay? And he brings his own ring. And he unfurls it. And when a season of Job comes upon you, it is hard to see that. You get caught up in the whys. Why? Last week. My brother over here talked about why, you know, that season of why. You get caught up in the whys, you get caught up in the what, w, WTHs. <laughs> yeah. And when friends come along and start filling your ringside seats uh, to watch you sling it out with God, they hear you say why, they will give you their opinion. You didn't ask for it, they'll give it. Well, you're hiding something. Job, obviously, you pissed God off. That's the why. You're not as righteous as we all thought you were. Mm -hmm. you're, uh, you're a sinner. That's the only explanation. You have really messed up. And you just need to come clean. That's what, what Job hears over and over and over again. And round and round you go. Defending your righteousness. Hurtling questions at God. I grew up going to the state fair and I, would, I was drawn to the wall of death. Anybody remember the wall of death? I don't even know if they have it anymore. It's that motorcycle rider gets in there and goes in that circle round and round and round. You just look down on there and everybody's hoping you'll crash, you know, because it's what you do when you're 10 years old, you know. But you're just amazed, the wall of death. You're going round and round in circles. And then when you get caught in a season like this, that's exactly where you're going. You're corkscrewing yourself right into the ground. And that's where Job has been. Round one, when your world comes apart. Round two, when the words of men are about as empty as God is silent. Round three, when faith soars outlandish. Job makes some incredible declarations of faith. Round four, when you can't find God. Round five, when there's nothing more to pray. And that's where Job was when we left him last week. He's face down on the ground, on his ash heap. He is done. Remember, there's two ways to be done with a fork or two, two proverbial sayings with a fork. Stick a fork in me, I'm done. Or the fork, the best is yet to come. And Job, Job is of the stick a fork in me, I'm done variety. And I imagine he's face down in the ashes. He's breathing ashes. Perhaps these are the ashes of all the sacrifices he has made through the years on behalf of his newly deceased children. That's a possibility. As Job 1 tells us, how he would always make the sacrifices for his children lest they sin against God. Perhaps these are ashes of his dreams, ashes of his hopes, the ashes of what once was. Could it be, just asking the question, could it be that Job is worshiping ashes and that is why he can't see the beauty yet. I mean, Isaiah 61, 3, God makes the promise, I will bestow beauty for ashes. But I have to pause. That's really probably an unfair question for me to ask Job when he's where he is right now. Job is down. And we have two more chapters of Elihu. He was introduced last week and 
Thank you so much for your observation there, Kristen, because it kind of spun me a little bit in, in, in Elihu's direction. Yeah, I'm just like, okay. And yeah, he does say some great things right here. But here he is. Job is face down in the ashes, and Elihu is just prattling on. <laughs> he doesn't get it. And he begins there in verse uh, 2 of chapter 36. He says, bear with me a little longer, and I will show you that there is more to be said on God's behalf. Yeah, but sometimes we need to be discerning enough to let God say it, okay? <laughs> I kind of think maybe that's where he is because of what he says next. He says, I get my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe justice to my maker. Be assured that my words are not false. One perfect in knowledge is with you. <laughs> well, I have to say, Elihu has a few gems in his sometimes overinflated noggin. That's why it would be wise for all of us to discern the message above the source. Is the message coming from the heart of God? And he does say some things that comes from the heart of God. Going down to verse 15 of chapter 36. And again, I'm just kind of doing a quick overview. Here's what he says. He says, but those who suffer he delivers. God delivers in their suffering. He speaks to them in their affliction. Now, I notice what he did not say. He did not say God delivers them out of their suffering. He says it's in their suffering. I think that's telling. What Elihu says God does, God is about to do. He just doesn't know it yet. The second thing, the next verse, verse 16, he says, God is wooing you from the laws of distress to a spacious place, free from restriction to the comfort of your table, laden with choice food. God is wooing you, Job. God is wooing us too, by the way. He woos us from the knot that we're tied up in from the cell where you lie paralyzed and the door's wide open. He woos you out of those places to the wide open spaces where you have freedom, where you can breathe. And then he woos you to redemption's table. Picture that table laden with food, choice food. I didn't set out to make a connection between Broken Worship Gathering and Redemption Table podcast, but the connection's already there just is. And God laid both these things upon my heart. I wasn't saying, how can I connect these two? They just are. It's just how it works. And when I saw this verse this week, I saw this verse this week because I was looking over it. I was like, wow. Yes, God is wooing us. Always. Such good stuff. And then the next verse, if you read the next few verses, Elihu turns towards accusation and condemnation again. <laughs> I mean, he just starts blasting Job again. Here's what I suspect. Elihu is a young man sorting all of this out on his, young, on his own. I think Elihu is wrestling with God in the season of Elihu. Okay? He's in a storm of his own of some kind. And hey, don't we get it? That's the truth of our lives, is it not? We're all in some kind of storm. Sometimes it's just a little storm. Sometimes it's a whirlwind. I think that's what's going on with Elihu here. So again, I don't discredit. He does say some good stuff. And then in verse 26, I think he looked at our song that we were singing tonight. Verse 26, he says, How great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is past finding out. <laughs> Give some praise here. And then the next thing Elihu does is what a lot of us do. He starts talking about the weather. Did you notice that? He starts, and he's just kind of fascinated. He starts pondering the wonders of the water cycle. He starts talking about clouds and how God puts rain upon the earth. And, and he suddenly starts talking a lot about thunder. I noticed that. I think Elihu must have been a fan of thunder. I think if it was invented then, he would have watched the Weather Channel. He might have been a storm chaser because he starts talking about thunder. He gets jazzed by thunder over and over again. Verse 29, who can understand how God thunders from his pavilion? 
Verse 33, God's thunder announces the coming storm. Even the cattle make known its approach. If you've ever been out in the country, you will notice that. The cattle start bawling when there's a storm coming. Pay attention to the animals. They often tell you long before the storm arises. Verse 30, excuse me, verse 1 of the next chapter, verse 31. At this, my heart pounds and leaps from its place. He's talking about thunder. <laughs> Listen. Verse 2, listen to the roar of his voice, God's voice, to the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Verse 4, he thunders with his majestic voice. Verse 5, God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. If you skip on down to verse 12, it says, at his direction, the clouds swirl around. I'm going to put a pause right here. Elihu said this long before we knew anything about Doppler radar. We can look at the Doppler radar now and see exactly what he's talking about here. You know who Elihu sounds like to me? He sounds like James Spann. <laughs> he sounds like a weatherman. And then he says this, verse 13. It says, God brings the clouds to punish men or to water his earth and show his love. <laughs> the love of God is introduced in this book for the first time right before God shows up. I don't think that's coincidental at all. And he talks about punishment, punishment, discipline. I think it's more, I think he's a little inaccurate here. Yes, God will punish sin. There's no doubt about that. The Bible tells us that. But he disciplines those he loves. Verse 14, listen to this, Job. I think at this moment he's not saying, hey, listen what, to what I have to say. He's like, listen to the thunder, because I think there was a gathering storm fastly approaching, and it was about to bear down upon them, and the earth is rumbling with thunder. And he's like, stop and consider God's wonders. Last part of verse 14. Look. Look. And I think Job, for the first time, is looking up now, not because he's following Elihu's instructions, but I think a big, plump raindrop just hit the back of his neck. <laughs> and I think it might have soothed some of his sores. And I think he realizes something's going on here. The earth is trembling. The storm is coming. It's almost on top of them. Elihu keeps going, verse 19. He says, tell us what we should say to God. He's asking Job, what we, something's happening here. What should we say to him? We cannot draw up our cases because of our darkness. Verse 20, should he be told that I want to speak? <laughs> Would any man ask to be swallowed up? Job, if you want to issue a retraction, all this grumbling you've been doing towards God, now might be a good time to do it because I think something's about to unfold here. Verse 24, the last verse, he says, he speaks. Therefore, men revere God, for does he not have regard for all the wise in heart? And suddenly, he's off the scene. Evidently, the perfect spot for God to suck the breath right out of Elihu's lungs and the words right out of his mouth because God shows up. <laughs> Elihu, unbeknownst even to himself, and God probably did it that way on purpose because he just didn't need to know. Elihu is like the, in, the announcer. If you've ever watched wrestling, <laughs> I don't. But, you know, I know they, it happens before a wrestling match, before a boxing match, before the main event. What do you hear? Let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> That's Elihu's role. He didn't know God was coming. He didn't know God was going to steal his thunder. That's what he does. But he was used of God to set the stage. He set the stage and he's gone. An interesting thing, when God spoke at the very end of chapter 42, God talks about the other three friends Elihu doesn't even get credit as the final credits roll. I don't know what that's about. And Job, this happens so swiftly. 
This was something he yearned for. All through this book, he's been praying. I just would God show up? Would he be my advocate? I, I, he would he stand here and we can talk and we can contend together? And God shows up and he's in for a big surprise. When you're deep in the epicenter of your crater, it is hard to hear the surround sound of God's grace. And that's where he's been. When you're examining your ashes with a magnifying glass, it's hard to witness the wonder swirling around about you. <laughs> when you ask God for anything, expect to receive a totally different answer, a totally different response than what you ask for. We often ask for mere shadows. God brings the sun that cast those shadows. I have found that our God expectations and God's reality are just vastly different. Even when God in his perfect will gives us exactly what we ask for, there's always something we just didn't see. So much more than we asked for, even though it's what we asked for. And Job, has been inviting God into the ring of why. And God unfurls his own ring. The ring of who. Who. Verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job. About to get an answer, okay? Out of the storm, God said, Who is this? that darkens my counsel. Who is this who walked up on me where I was and started pressing in on me, demanding an answer? Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. First question, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me. And I just believe there was a long pause here between that first question. Just silence. Because I think Job was like, can't answer that. Okay, God goes to the next question. Who marked off the earth's dimensions? Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together? Isn't that beautiful? Now we know something about stars. A beam of light can be transformed into sound waves revealing each individual star's song. Did you know that? Talk about singing stars. They had no way of knowing that. But God did. God who led this to be written, he knew. He goes on with his questions. God does. He goes to the oceans. All right, let's go to the oceans. Who took charge of the ocean? I love the way the message says it here. Who took charge of the ocean when it was gushed forth like a baby from the womb? And then I made a playpen for it. And I told you, you stay there. You go no further. This is your limits. You're in time out. Because you would just cause too much havoc if you got out of your plate again. And you know, that would be true if the oceans got out. And on and on and on God goes. He is plying Job with one question after another. You know there are 77 questions in all. God is wearing Job out. God didn't, excuse me, Job didn't answer any of these 77 questions either, by the way. God is wearing Job out. But you know what? If you need to be disciplined, and we all do from time to time, I just got to say, what better way than to be worn out by wonder? Like I say, when this series began, I anticipated tonight, I fully expected to spend the majority of this time talking about these questions. I think I could say something almost about every single one of them. I mean... I know there's a whole other message here that can be preached at another time. It's not going to fit into this series. 
And I want to give you opportunity tonight, just a moment into the discussion. You talk about that section there and all that, that struck you. But this is such beautiful imagery here in these questions. God, the creator, crafts his words very well. And it takes me back to places I've been and things that I've seen. For example, I'm just going to cite a few of them. In verse 22 of 38, he says, Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? I have not, but I have a memory from a couple of years ago, hiking up the going to the Sun Road at Glacier National Park, right there at the Continental Divide. And it was the day before they opened up the road and the snow plows had just gone through. And I was walking through uh, a cavern of snow, so to speak. It was twice as tall as I was on either side. It's like storehouses of snow. Verse 1 of chapter 39, he says, Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? And again, I think of chasing after mountain goats when I was in Glacier, looking for their whereabouts. And I only saw them from a distance through binoculars. I never had the opportunity to get up, up close and personal with one. I did with bears. Love that. But I didn't get up close and personal with mountain goats. So that's still to be done. Verse 5, he talks about the wild donkeys. He says, who let the wild donkey go free? And I think of being very close to Boquillas Canyon, down on the Rio Grande River, hiking the Marufo Vega Trail, and we came across a herd of wild donkeys. And they were just staring at us. Got kind of close to them. That was kind of cool. There is wonder upon wonder upon wonder here. I don't know how you hear God asking these questions. I don't know how you hear his tone. I think sometimes this is spoken in such a way that it makes God sound like he's angry. And I do think God began in a no-nonsense no manner to get Job's attention. I think he lays into Job heavy and thick at first, but I don't think he kept that tone for very long. I think God hid his smile as long as God can hide his smile. Because this is his servant. <laughs> this is his choice servant. Job has passed a test he didn't even know he was taking. Job did not curse God in the process as the devil had proposed and Satan got knocked on his backside where he belongs as a result. God won the bet. Satan lost it. I think God's gloves came off and God's smile came out. I was reading one of Mark Buchanan's books this year. I've read, read a couple of them. God walk and the holy wild. And he makes the comment. He just says, God meets Job's pain and his comforter's arrogance with a whirlwind tour of his art gallery, his inventor's lab, his manufacturing plant. And then he goes on to say this. He says, look, Job, I'm here to say, look what I've made. You've been sitting here on this dung heap so long with this pain in your heart and in your flesh so long, with these boring windbags haranguing you for so long that you've grown blind to beauty. Everyone's trying to fix you, Job. I'm not. I'm trying to wow you. And I think he's right. God pauses midway and he gives Job a chance to answer. There in verse 1 through 7 of Chapter 40, it says, the Lord said to Job, will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer twice, but I will say no more. In other words, That's what then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm brace yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me and then he starts off again God resumes as if to say no you wanted to contend with me tell you what let me make this easier for you Latter part of verse 40, latter part of verse 41, he says, I'll tell you what, let me pick an alternate to come and wrestle you in your ring. And I know just the perfect one to start with. You can have a cage match with them. Here's my first contender for you, Behemoth. 
a hippopotamus. God goes old school Robin Williams Jumanji on Joe Beard. So I'll tell you what, you're going to wake up in the morning, you're going to have a hippopotamus in your bedroom, and the doors are going to be locked. See how long you contend with him. Okay? See what you can do with that. <laughs> He's a little stout. He might step on you. He might do some internal permanent damage. But hey, you've been asking for this. What? Don't want to do the behemoth? Okay, I'll tell you what. Chapter 41. Uh, i tell you what we'll do. How about a Leviathan? We don't even know what that is. <laughs> I mean, some translators just say sea monster. Some say crocodile. And I think crocodile is pretty good. You know, it's like a crocodile on steroids. You contend with him. Cage match. You and the croc. All right. Since it's all a croc anyway, right? Isn't that what you've been hitting at? Best three out of five, Job. How about it? We'll hold the match in Vegas. Hadn't been built yet. And I'll get Elton John to come sing Crocodile Rock to get it all started. But hey, it'll be a blast. Of course, if you lay a hand on him, he says, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. <laughs> and then I love this. I love what Peterson, Eugene Peterson does in the message because Robert is just not in the Bible. But he says this about the Leviathan. He says this about the uh, crocodile. He says he is unstoppable as a barge. I'll just tell you, that's true. <laughs> I got a head five times as thick as most people, I think. <laughs> Come on, Job. God's saying, if you can't contend with either one of them, what made you think you could contend with me? <laughs> Verse 11, he says, who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. Chapter 42, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? It was me. Surely I, I spoke some things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. A few takeaways from this right here. When you don't know, whatever. When you don't know, you have to trust God has things in store for you, too wonderful for you to know yet. You just got to trust. Billy Joel, it's all a matter of trust. Second thing, I would like to ask Job, was the wrestling worth it? I thought about that question. Was it worth it? Could the wrestling have been avoided? I think Job would say, the wrestling was worth it because it was through the wrestling, through the outcome of the wrestle, that he experiences God. I mean, he says, you know, I've heard of you. Now I know you. Now I've seen you. So, yeah, I think it's worth the wrestle. And for you and for me, I will say the next time a storm comes through or you're in the storm, now it's worth the wrestle for that reason alone right there. The third thing I'd say, sometimes the storm is inside of us. And that's where God meets us. Wherever the storm is, he either brings the storm or he comes to the storm. Sometimes he sends the storm of his presence to smash the storm of our past. Then God's final response his quick epilogue here. <laughs> I love this. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, I'm angry with you and your two friends because you are just a bunch of chuckleheads. <laughs> Let's paraphrase. 
<laughs> you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job will pray for you and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. He says, so they did that. The Lord accepted Job's prayer. Interesting thing here, seven bulls, seven rams. That's a lot of sacrifice because I don't know if you, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel received God's instructions and said, you bring seven bulls, seven rams, and this would be a sacrifice for an entire nation. And these are just three guys who should have kept their mouth shut. It says, after Job prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as all he had before. His family came, they comforted him, brought gifts. And to me, just an important verse for me in my life. Has been for a while now. Verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. I claim that. I want that blessing. And then he talks about his livestock, and I'm like, okay, that's great. I love livestock. I'm not going to worry about the cow here. He talks about, I love this. He had three daughters, beautiful daughters. Doesn't even mention the sons. I love that, you know, because usually it's a, it's a man-oriented culture here. And then it says Job made sure that his daughters got an equal inheritance. There's just something beautiful about the way, the way this uh, closes out. And after all this, Job lived 140 more years. He got to see his great-great-grandchildren, his children, their children, their children's children, etc. Cool book. We're going to pause this. We're going to lean in and uh, 